Hello, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction of our panelists, um, and then they're each going to speak for about five minutes. Um, we're going to start with Alan Gomez. Um, he's a Miami-based reporter for USA Today. He covers immigration in Latin America. He has focused on all aspects of the immigration debate, from congressional efforts in Washington, D.C., to the daily lives of undocumented immigrants from California to Kansas to North Carolina. He also travels throughout Latin America to chronicle why immigrants leave their countries, and more recently, he has led the paper's coverage of the historic diplomat diplomatic opening between the U.S. and Canada. He's a native of Miami, and he graduated from Florida International University. Um, and then we'll be uh, hearing from Patty Lowe. Patty is a PhD um, at, in the UW Madison professor in life sciences communication. Um, she is a documentary producer and a former broadcast journalist in public and commercial television. She is the award-winning author of three books, uh, Indian Nations of Wisconsin, Native People of Wisconsin, which is used by 18,000 um, school children in Wisconsin as a social studies textbook, and also Seventh Generation Earth Ethics, a collection of biographies of Native American environmental leaders in Wisconsin. She's produced documentaries, including the award-winning Way of the Warrior, which aired nationally on PBS in 2007. And her outreach... I'm quite a gal. <laughs> her outreach work <laughs> focuses on Native American youth and digital storytelling. And we are also excited to have here Henry Sanders um, from here in Madison. Uh, he is CEO and publisher of Madison 365. He was appointed by the Obama administration as the Region V advocate for the Small Business Administration's Office of Advocacy, covering a six-state region. Sanders serves as a link between small business owners, the federal government, and the public and private sectors. He has also served on the board of directors of Group Health Cooperative since 2013. He's the founder of the Madison Area Growth Network and Propel Wisconsin Innovation, both nonprofit organizations dedicated to job creation and attracting and retaining skilled professionals. He's also worked for um, then Congresswoman Tom, uh, Tammy Baldwin as outreach coordinator and as vice president of the Greater Madison Chamber of Commerce. And if you haven't checked out Madison 365, it's a it's a startup that just um, appeared back in August, and it's really wonderful. So he's going to talk about that as well. So we'll start with um, Ellen. That's okay. Oh, um, I wanted to, uh, to just start with a prompt, and, and each of them will sort of um, talk a little bit about this, which is this panel, again, is about representation. It's about language. It's about source selection. It's about imagery, um, particularly in journalism. So given their, all their expertise in this area, I wanted them to talk about what do they see as the problems related to language source selection and imagery in news coverage, but also what might good examples of this look like in journalism? So we'll start with Alan and then go to Patty and then finally with, um, with Henry. Uh, well, first off, good morning and thank you very much uh, for having us here. Uh, when they first sent me sort of the outline of what this panel was going to be about and kind of looking at problems with language, imagery, and sources, um, as somebody who covers immigration, my first thought was, how long is this going to be? Because <laughs> I could be here all day talking about major, major problems um, in all of those areas. And it's a, you know, we're focused here on the journalistic aspect, but this is a very much a shared responsibility in that there's big flaws in how the media presents the immigration debate, how politicians debate it, and how the public understands it. Um, and again, rather than sit here and vent for an entire day, um, I, I thought I'd just start with just a couple of quick examples, um, and then maybe we can kind of get into some of it a little more during the Q&A. Um, and the first is an image, um, and it's one that I'm sure all of you are familiar with, and it's that image of an undocumented immigrant jumping over the so southern border wall or crossing into, through the desert or sneaking into the country somehow. Um, to be absolutely clear, that is a huge problem in this country. Hundreds of thousands of people cross that border every day legally. Um, hundreds of people die every year um, crossing through there. And I will not begrudge anybody who thinks that any sovereign nation should be able to control its borders and know exactly who is coming in and going out. But the problem becomes when news organizations are writing about anything to do with immigration and they use that image. And the problem there is that the immigration debate is a very complex, nuanced, 50-state, federal problem. There's so many aspects to it. 
Um, and what we do when we just look at the, when we, pub, when we throw out that image of somebody illegally entering the country is we reduce all of that to one of simply border security. Um, they're not coming over just because they can cross the border. That's just one component of why we have 11 million undocumented immigrants in this country. They're coming because we have major flaws in our legal immigration system. We're currently operating under the 1965 law that pretty much set the, the framework for what our immigration system looks like, so that's a little bit outdated at this point. Um, there are major problems in the countries that they're coming from that we're not spending the time to really explore and understand. Um, there are huge problems in the treatment of immigrants that are living here and have been here for a long time and how they're getting educated and how they're contributing to the economy, yet all we see is that image of them crossing the border. I mean, you see it on a loop on TV networks, you see pictures of it on TV, and so that's one of the, those images that I know we try very hard to only use if we're specifically talking about strategies along the border to stop people from coming over. Other than that, we, go, we, we try very hard to make sure that we're showing other images, but that's something that's a very lazy thing that I think we do here that really makes it difficult to have a broader, fuller discussion um, about immigration in this country. Um, when it comes to language, um, one of the things that's always bothered me is, you know, when you cover immigration, you hear a lot of, let's say, colorful language. It's, um, I've had to tell my mother to stop reading the comment section on my stories because it's just horrible. Um, and one of the, the one example I wanted to use is the idea that, you know, in every state, in many cities, and especially in Washington, they're always at least debating some kind of immigration law. Um, and any time somebody comes out against a law that may help an undocumented immigrant or may maybe get, give them a path to citizenship in this country, somebody calls them a racist or a xenophobe. And that's always bugged me because there are many, yeah, sure, there are plenty of racists in this country and there's a lot of people that oppose any kind of immigration reform in this country because they're racist, because they don't like the way that this country is changing, the browning of America in some respect. Um, but when everybody is then called, when you immediately revert to accusations of racism or xenophobia, um, I think it makes it that much harder to have a better debate. Um, it pushes everybody into their corners. It pushes everybody to a more extreme position. And it makes it harder to have that very nuanced discussion that you're going to have or that you should have um, to be able to explore these issues. Um, and then on the issue of sourcing, um, I, I'm based in Miami right now, but I lived in D.C. for about eight years. Um, and I was there while they were the last time Congress tried to pass a major immigration law to completely overhaul um, our system. And what kept striking me over and over is that you have this sort of group, and this is, this is a very D.C. problem, um, and it extends beyond just the immigration debate, but basically any, we would quote, you know, obviously the politicians who were debating and kind of going over uh, what they were trying to do with the, with the laws, um, but every, anytime we tried to go outside of that, anytime we tried to get some opinions from anybody outside, there was about five pro-immigration groups, about three anti-immigration groups in D.C., they'd quote the directors of those groups and that was it. And that's why we always make, again, uh, I feel like I'm defending us right here, but it's, I think it's very important to, we would always try to go out into the communities. If there was a bill that they were considering about agricultural, agricultural workers and trying to get visas to get in here, we would, we would go to farms and talk to people and try to figure out what the system was and talk to farmers and talk to the undocumented immigrants who were working there. Um, and that we tried to extend that to every part of the debate as much as we could. Um, so that's just a very, especially with these kind of topics, um, again, not just immigration, but with so many issues, it's just so easy to go to the director of any group that studied it, get their opinion, and you feel like you've checked that box and move along. Um, these, uh, we got plenty to talk about here, but I'm gonna make this, uh, I'm gonna just make this very brief and uh, just pass it on. Thank you. Thank Patty? You. Uh, I began my career in broadcast journalism in 1974 in radio and then moved to television a year later. Um, back then, it was film, um, and working at a tiny station in La Crosse, Wisconsin, I shot, processed, edited, reported, anchored, and produced the newscast that I did there. Um, in my career, I watched technology move from film to videotape, microwaves, um, fiber optics, 
24-7 news being beamed to local affiliates from our, um, our network bases in Chicago and New York and Los Angeles. And thinking about where diversity was back in 1974 and where it is today and our ability to cover issues involving communities of color, it seems to me that the explosion of technology has just enabled us to screw up faster uh, and, uh, and reach a wider audience with our mistakes. I'm looking at um, the 2015 minority percentages at newspapers, American Society of Newspaper Editors report. And I'm looking at the Daily Press in Ashland, which is um, a county where almost one third of the residents are Native Americans, and there's no one there on staff, there are no people of color there, period. Uh, same for the Chippewa Herald, same for the Leader Telegram, the state's official newspaper, the Wisconsin State Journal, American Indian, zero. Asian American, zero. Black, zero. Hispanic, zero. Multiracial, zero. This is our official newspaper. And televisions, lest you think I'm picking on, on newspapers, um, television stations aren't any better. Um, I'm looking at the 2015 um, RTNDA, Radio Television News Directors Association. African, uh, so we have about 37% minority population in the United States. African Americans represent 10.8% of uh, news professionals working in our nation's newsrooms, television newsrooms. Hispanics represent 8.2%, Asian Americans 2.9%, and Native Americans 0.3%. So my experience, um, I've, I've held just about every uh, position you can hold in a, in a newsroom, and I've worked in small, medium, and, and major markets. Um, Native Americans are invisible. We tend to cover the powwows at powwow time. We see them during Thanksgiving, maybe at Columbus Day. But other than that, they're, they're just invisible. And when I um, was dragged kicking and screaming into um, a news director's position at one time, that I, I have the utmost respect for, for news directors. It's not a job I wanted, and it's not a job I enjoyed. But one of the things that I did was I, I found myself in a, a position of being able to, to clean house. Um, and it, my experience has really given me the opportunity to observe how racism is institutionalized in our newsrooms. And one of them, and I'll give you an example, this was in the, the, the early 90s. Um, this was back when crack babies were a big story. And ABC News had done a story about crack babies um, in Washington, D.C., and had gotten into a, a neonatal unit at a local hospital. Washington, D.C. is a predominantly African-American community, so naturally the babies in the neonatal unit would be African-American. I don't know whether any of those babies actually were crack babies, but th this was what was projected by the visuals used in this story. And of course, um, our local newsroom videotaped that feed coming down from New York, and it became stock footage, so every time there was a story about about crack or crack babies, that's the video that got rolled out and played over and over and over again. And so what we were telling our viewers is that all crack babies are black and crack is essentially a black issue, which of course was not the case. So when I was, when I was news director, what I did was I pulled all the stock footage that perpetuated all these stereotypes and erased all of it. And I, you know, that was my little contribution, but I know how that works, and we still see that. It's, we're still going to see, whenever there's an immigration issue, whether or not it involves Hispanic people, we're going to see the image of the brown person coming over a fence somewhere or sneaking through a desert, um, or whose body is going to be rolled out of, an, uh, out of a truck somewhere. Um, this is how 
we perpetuate these stereotypes. And until we have people in our newsrooms that reflect the communities they cover, and, it's, and, and I'm not saying that you have to be a person of that community in order to cover that community. It's all about relationships. It's about gaining trust and knowing the community, regardless of your ethnicity or your racial background. But unless we have diversity in our newsrooms, we're not going to address these problems. Um, well, first let me say uh, welcome, Alan, to our cold weather here. And he's from Florida, and he was like, "Oh my gosh, it's so cold here." So a Florida guy, it's mad in Wisconsin. Nothing better in Wisconsin in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Sure, you know, I know it's not Florida, but I'm just <laughs> I'm an advocate for Wisconsin here. So I am not a journalist. I had, don't have a journalist background. Um, so it's kind of odd that I'm here speaking to journalists in, in that field. I see myself as more of a community builder, a capacity builder. And so we, I have a, a, a website called Madison 365. It's a nonprofit organization that's mission is to reach people of color and to also to help create some pipelines um, to help these industries have people of color in the, in the, uh, the, me, the media. And so um, we have a different tact. We, we first started in August and we reached about 10,000 people. Now we're reaching over about over 300,000 people. Um, which is really unheard of for a person of color magazine. And I think one of the reasons we, we, we do well, and we're talking about imagery and all that stuff, that's great, and I think we all know that images can be powerful, but the underlying thing is trust, right? And how do we build trust in communities of color? And I think that, is, that will help deal with all these different kind of things that we're talking about. And, one of the things that we, we do for our, our organization is we really let people of color speak their minds. It's not, we are not filtering their voices. We are not trying to filter their opinions. We let them have their, and I, I tell you, if you go to our website, there are some very strong opinions. Um, I've actually heard from some of my white friends that said, I've, your site is very provocative. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, well, it's, I don't think it's provocative. It's just you're just hearing from the people of color from their, their true perspective. Um, and going back to images, I think images can be powerful. And one of the things we did early on, we, we created a list from the most influential um, African Americans in Wisconsin. It's never been done. But our headline was Black Power, the most influential 28 people in the state of Wisconsin. It's never been done, right? The image, think of the image that's set for people who are used to seeing people of color in mugshots or whatever they might see. We set a different standard. We said, no, that's not the case. We set 28 people across the state. I had people, kids calling me, parents calling me, saying this is with just crying. I had a dad call me crying like, you know what? My, my kid has never seen anything like this before. Thank you. We did something for the Latino community. We did the most um, powerful influential people in the Latino community in the state of Wisconsin, 48. It's never been done. To set a standard and an image is saying, look, people of color in Wisconsin are more than just what you're trying to pigeonhole us. And just so you know, we're doing a Native American one next. Hey. So, so just, I'm with you, sister. I'm with you. I hear you. Um, and so I, I think that's part of it. I think language is also important. Um, but language could be bad or good. So I, 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 I'll give you a positive way that we use language. So if you're familiar with hip hop, um, which I look like a lot of you people are hip hop heads in here, so um, that we had a, we had a, a headline, one of our stories was a hundred state of mind. So this person was from New York. And if, if you know who Nas is, there's a, a song called New York State of Mind, right? So one of our things we put, it's a, this guy's from New York, we said he's, and he's part of a hundred state, which is an incubator up on State Street, the headline was, this guy has 100 state of mind, right? Now, that language for the average person didn't mean anything, but from our community, they loved it, right? Because we're saying, we're tying our culture to people, how this hip hop, how this language be would use to an everyday story. So it's just little things that we do to use our language to craft, um, to connect to our communities. Um, and I, for another thing, I think for Mass 365, what we do is different, is we look at stories from a personal color perspective. Uh, we give you examples. The city council in Madison just had a um, 
so we have a president who was uh, white, and we had a pro tem, a vice president who was a person of color. First time this ever happened in the city of Madison in our leadership that there was a pro tem or vice president part of city council leadership. Well, they had an election last week. He got overthrown. The person who tried to run the vice president next was a woman of color. She got overthrown. And no one talked about it from that perspective, right? That this is the first time historically that Madison could have had a leadership of color run the city of Madison. No one wrote that story. No one thought about it from that angle. We're writing that story. but. If you think about all the issues we have in Madison, that would have been one of the few things you thought would have been the angle, right? You have a person who could have been the first president African American ever in the city of Madison got overthrown by two white people, right? No one's ever thought about that. So these are the type of things that we do that's really helping us. And um, yeah, I, I think um, also I want to say this about language too, and this comes back to trust. Um, there was a young man got killed here in Madison called Tony Robinson. Um, and got shot and, and killed. And I and just remember the language being used between different communities, right? The language they were used in community of color was he was murdered. The language that you read in the other part of the media was he was killed or whatever. I mean, those are type of things that you, you show an empathy or, or not towards the color and understand how the community of color are perceiving things. Again, building trust. So those are some of the things that we're, we're doing at Master 65. Thank you very much. So we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions because we really would like this to be more of a dialogue than sort of us sort of talking at you. Um, so does, does anyone have any questions for any, any of our panelists right now? I think Jason has one over here and then um, this woman in the front. I mean, I'll, I guess I'll just start off saying that I've never bought into the idea that it sounds quaint to quote somebody if they're using all sorts of like broken English or if, if, it, if it's coming across in a way that you know it could be caricatured or made fun of. Um, if, if somebody's trying to, to articulate a point and you understand what they're saying, I don't think there's anything wrong with paraphrasing the heck out of what they're saying, trying to summarize what they're saying, and then there's parts of what they're saying that you can pull out in the quote as just like a little exclamation mark, um, as a point to sort of end it. Um, I'm a big fan of three-word quotes. Um, if, it, if it makes a, not three specifically, but just a, a very small something just to accentuate it, um, because yeah, there's, there's, you know, covering first, second generation immigrants, there's a lot of terrible English out. If I quoted my parents, it would be a little bit rough, um, what, they were, what they were saying. And while some people might find it endearing and some people might say, hey, look, they're trying to learn the language or something like that, I know, unfortunately, very well that there's far too many people who will see that and say, hey, they're, tr they're not, see, they're not learning the language or, or they're uneducated, or focus on that part of it rather than focus on what they're actually trying to say. Either of you disagree with Alan? 
I don't disagree. It's not really an issue in television news because you just take the clip and, and you're, you're not filtering that. But I will say this is that one of my pet peeves is quite often when I see news reports involving Native Americans, I will, especially if it's at, over, let's say, a contentious issue involving, you know, envi an environmental issue, I'll see one side, the state or um, a company perspective where the person is interviewed uh, with a backdrop of some official looking, um, in, in some official looking environment, let's say a state capitol or a building, and the native representative is put on the phone with a static photo and maybe a graphic that says, on the phone, and you're hearing the scratchy voice um, over a phone line, and, um, and the reporter truly believes that he or she has presented a balanced report, which is not the case at all because the quality of the interviews are not the same. I would uh, wait. Um, I would not try to do uh, a, try to get that story in a deadline situation. I would send a report. I would take the time to send a reporter up north spend some time in the community, gather some interviews, or I would call a, an affiliate that was closer in Wausau or Rhinelander and get them to do an interview on videotape and then um, microwave or beam the, you know, somehow beam that story, the, the interview back so that each interview had, a, you know, the same quality. I don't think I would alter the background. I would just be mindful that uh, I was privileging one perspective over the other. You know, for me, I think it's a slippery slope, right? I, I, I mean, because it depends who you have in your newsroom, it depends who's editing. Uh, you know, one of our writers is white, and I know we've had many debates about language, what language should be used, what shouldn't be used, what we should edit, what we shouldn't edit. and. One of the downsides, if, uh, if you don't have people of color around who understand the culture, you, for a lack of a better word, you can whitewash some of the things that comes out, right? And so you really have to balance that out. And the only way you can really do that is, again, I'm coming to this word trust. The people who are giving you the opinions have to trust that, that they know what you're going to use, that you're going to do it in a way that really represents what they're saying. Um, but you also have to understand you have to use in language that doesn't take away from the culture of what they're trying to say. So to do that, you have to have people who understand the culture and understand what those words are and how you should be using them. It's, a, it's, it's really difficult, and I would say the best solution to that is having people run your editorial board, the people who edit things, who are outside of your comfort zone, um, who are people of color who can actually help you with those conversations. Because those are, I'm telling you, I've had intense conversations with my staff about that. Um, so I. I think I say it's a each situation is different, but I always lean it towards going to what the people were saying, um, and kind of letting them have that voice. You don't want them sounding um, you use the quaint or whatever, but you don't want to sound ignorant, right? But you you want to make sure that they that the same that the meaning is still there, and what the media tends to do in the general is whitewash those things and take those out, which leaves takes away the umph or the pain or the passion what people are trying to say. We had a woman right here. Hello, my name is Naja Ellison. I'm a producer and director for Wisconsin Public Radio for the Joy Cardine Show. And this morning, um, I produced the show on based around Beyonce's new video album, Lemonade. My angle was not um, the fact that her album was inspired from the infidelity involved with her marriage, but it was more so about how for generations, black women have been expected to suffer in silence and how whenever she's angry, the angry black woman is scorned. So um, when doing this show, I understand that our listeners, most of our listeners are um, white men 50 and above and um, white women 50 and above. We do have some millennials as listeners, but we got a lot of feedback in terms of how disappointed 
they were in us for having this show and producing this show. And I thought that my reasoning for doing this show was to shed light on there's more to this album than the, you know, than the lyrics. I mean, the lyrics were powerful as well, but there's, there's so much um, importance to this album. There's so many deep messages. And when you know that your listener base is don't care, or I don't want to say don't care, but when you know that your listener base don't have quite of an interest in um, the history of black women, or don't have quite of an interest in the history of cultural, you know, whatever the case may be, how do you go about covering um, topics that you know will diversify your audience and you want to shed light on it, but your audience isn't diverse. You don't want to lose your audience, but you want to diversify it. That's one of our goals with WPR, is to diversify our audience. But how, when our audience is all white? So I, well, again, this is a perfect, perfect, perfect example. Again, so Math 365, we're in a white city, right? And we're reaching over 300,000 people is because I, what you're saying is true. So that Beyonce, like the thing that stuck out to me and the story we're gonna do on is remember when she talked about Malcolm X and then she talks about black women are the most, that to me was the most powerful part of, of, the, of the video, right? Now, most people are talking about the infidelity, et cetera. To go to, to really do what you do, keep doing what you're doing, right? Because there is an audience out there and there's a white audience. I mean, we're, not, we're reaching people, and it's not all people of color, right? So there's a white audience that wants it, but you have to stay authentic, right? Because people will not buy it if you're just trying to do what, what you did today is what you should keep doing, right? And then also make strategically that you get that message out in front of people of color. Let them know the type of things you're doing, um, I think is key. If, if, even if you just write for Mass and 365 or anyone like that, but getting those messages out to people, because I think it's important, but stay authentic. Because if you don't get authentic, our audience won't buy it. We people of color won't accept it. And then you lost what you're trying to do. And white people, once they see that people of color, this is what they want, they will follow along because they want to learn just like anyone else. So yeah, and that's awesome what you did. And the idea that you got a lot of people who were upset with the report, that's not a bad thing at all. <laughs> I mean, that's for A, they're hearing something obviously they're not accustomed to. So that's fine. Um, and there is, I can, I'm sure there's a lot of other people who just listened to it and appreciated that they were hearing something that they hadn't heard and that they didn't read on whatever blogs that they go on each day. Um, if I showed you my email inbox, it's horrific, it's horrible. Um, if I write anything about undocumented immigrants, let's say, who were contributing to the economy of the United States, oh my God, it's unbelievable. Um, but I don't have any problem getting that because I know that that's a message that those people especially need to hear and need to understand and need to learn more about. So don't take those kind of calls. Don't, get, don't feel bad about that. That's you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, which is educating people on something that they otherwise didn't know about. I think you have to learn to pivot. Every single one of your listeners, even though they're white and they're old, has a connection to that story somehow. They, they all, you know, many of them have children in that age, and so there's, there's a space there that you can explore. If they've been long-term Madisonians, this was a progressive, I, I'd like to think it still is a progressive city, but back in the 60s and 70s when they were your age, they, you know, many of them were radical, liberal, progressive people that were out in the streets or, you know, there, there's that core in Madison. And so if you can find that space and make it relevant to them, and you shouldn't have to, but this is kind of what journalists of color, I mean, we have to work harder to find that relevance. But part of it might be history. Part of it might be just their family connections through their children. That's what I would do. Great questions. Another question? Um, I live in a very small town in Wisconsin where I'm the editor of a weekly newspaper. And um, this is a question about undocumented workers, which are all around us. But um, in all things, I have to be very sensitive because everybody's very identified. It's not like living in a big city with millions of people. Uh, people can figure out who you're talking about rather rapidly, even if you don't name them. So that's a little different than Miami and Washington, D.C. But yeah. um, 
I think there's a lot of um, misunderstanding about the work that undocumented workers do and the responsibilities they have and the amounts of money they make and things like that. And I guess I would like some input from people that deal in this sort of thing on how to approach that, how to approach what to, I don't want to cause immigration problems for people, and yet I want to report on it. Right. And so if you could give me some advice in that regard, I'd appreciate it. Just because I work for a big paper and I live in a very multicultural, large city, uh, doesn't mean that I don't go through exactly what you go through. And that's trying to tell the story of people whose entire lives have revolved around hiding and hiding their identity. Um, it's a constant struggle because the only way to personalize their story is to tell their story and to use their name and to use their picture. Um, you know, one of, one of the ways that uh, President Obama in uh, 2012 passed, uh, or not passed, uh, but just instituted an executive order to protect something like 500,000 uh, young undocumented immigrants from deportation. And the way that that happened is because a lot of young undocumented immigrants started, quote unquote, coming out and identifying themselves and going to congressional hearings and getting arrested and appearing on television and kind of forcing the issue until it kind of pushed the Obama administration to finally do that. Um, that kind of courage on the part of those young people is incredibly difficult, um, and it's going to be even more difficult if you're working in a tiny town where everybody knows everybody and you're afraid that if you raise your hand and say your name that they're going to come after you. Um, but that's a fight that I continue having all the time because it's one thing to just talk about this group and the abstract and sort of a theoretical idea about what they do and how they contribute. Um, it's quite another to say, you know, this specific person is doing this job, this is how little he makes, whatever is left over he's sending back to his family. And once you personalize it, that's the kind of thing that sort of opens some eyes about what they're going through, good and bad. Um, you know, if they took a job from somebody, that should be reported on. If they are doing a job that had been open for two years, then that's something that should be reported on. But all those nuances of the debate, it's best told when you are identifying people. And so it's worth the effort to just continue trying to talk to them and convince them in some cases. And there's been some people that have talked to me that I just haven't used their name because I felt that they weren't making, I don't want to say conscious decision, but they weren't quite fully aware that their name was going to be published all over the country. It's a really, really hard debate, but I think it's one that you should continue having and continue pushing for, because that's the only way to really sort of show people what they go through and what their lives are like. I think there is another way to cover the story, though. Um, look at some of the institutions, the United um, Migrant Worker, or not, not United, um, the Migrant Worker Board that uh, looks at um, migrant housing. Look at who's, who comprises that board. Look at the um, housing, the pit toilets and all the um, substandard housing that's been grandfathered in by that board and who those board members are. And I think you could tell some of those stories, you know, from an institutional perspective without s using specific names or even specific farms because that's going to give it away. But you can talk about how the structure in this state, um, you know, what's, what's going on there because I think there's a really important story that's not being told. Henry, did you want to chime in? No, I, I agree with what you just said. To just make it a broader, a broader story and uh, talk about rural areas in the country. And they're all dealing with the same issues, trust me. And um, I think being from Wisconsin, I understand what you're saying from small towns and people, unlike Florida, they might act on some of the things here. Um, so I understand what you're saying. I would make it broader and um, try to make some stories that might be going on in other rural areas and just kind of tie it to that. Just find out what's going on in other rural areas you're going to find similarities. We had a question in the back. Um, CV, is that CV? Uh, 
This is, this is more of a feeling than, than a, a question that I've been able to kind of think about how to say, uh, so bear with me. And I think that it's definitely for everyone, although, Alan, I kind of feel like I'm asking you the most just because as a, as a native Miamian, something I notice is that when I write academically as a graduate student, uh, I do a lot of what I'll call, for lack of a better word, code switching to kind of preserve the linguistic fugitivity of the way that people from Miami speak uh, and the way that Spanish speakers kind of have words that don't translate easily, but I often find myself really wanting to use in my academic writing, uh, but hesitate because I don't know that I want to expose uh, kind of in the same way that Henry was talking about, you know, certain lines in hip hop speaking to certain communities. I don't know that I really want to expose white audiences to a lot of that language. Uh, and do you ever find a tension with the words you really want to use, uh, but the words you feel like maybe you should or shouldn't uh, for a particular audience? Yeah, that's, um, man, that's a tough one. So right now I'm going to Cuba a lot, uh, covering the diplomatic changes between the US and Cuba, and specifically Cuban Spanish is insane. <laughs> and I, I was in my mid-20s when I realized that one of our most common words that we use as sort of like, a, an, ex, like, a, like an exclamation mark, as, as a sort of just a point of emphasis, is an incredibly vulgar word in the rest of Latin America. I was dating a Mexican girl, and she, she said, why do you keep saying that word? I'm like, what does it mean? And What? <laughs> I mean, it's, and this goes for a lot of the phrases that we use down there. Um, not that we're a vulgar people, it's just, that's, it, it's just, again, it's lost in translation. It doesn't come across right. Um, so yeah, no, that, that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, you don't want to, you don't want to take away the emphasis of what they're trying to say. You don't want to lose that meaning. Um, but at the same time, there are some words that A, just don't translate or translate into you know, a paragraph long explanation and you know, others that just don't work for a family newspaper. Um, it, it's, it's, it, that is definitely, whenever I go down there, every time I'm doing an interview um, and I'm taking my notes, I, 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 go, I can go back and forth between Spanish and English uh, enough where people can talk to me in Spanish, but I'm transcribing my notes in English. And there's always like those words in the middle of my notes that I just write the Spanish word for it, but continue writing in English, and then get back to it and just sit there and kind of look at it and go like this and wonder, and sometimes I'll call my sister or my mother and like, how would you translate this? I don't, um, in this context, and this is what they're trying to say, and we'll have like family discussions over how to translate a lot of these words. So it's, it's definitely a, a constant battle, and it's, and it's always very difficult. I mean, it's, I mean, all you can do is the best that you can. I mean, like I said, sometimes I just paraphrase it just to avoid it, um, and especially for those words that just don't have a literal translation. Um, but yeah, I mean, all I, all I can say is and the only advice I can give is just, you know, talk it through with other people who might um, know the word and understand the language. And that's how I, I think my boss would be surprised how often I call my family for translation help for those specific words to figure out, to make sure, you know, I call, I'm, I'm born and raised in Miami, but my parents are Cuban. And I know a lot of people obviously from there. And I just have so many conversations with them, just talking that through, trying to figure out the best way to present it. Excellent question. Patty? I'm often asked, um, do you prefer American Indian or Native American or indigenous? And I think most people, I, it's a generational kind of thing. I, I don't, I use all those terms interchangeably, but my mother, if you call her an Indian, she will, you know, not react well. Um, I think most Native people appreciate being identified by their, um, their nation affiliate first, and I use that word and would really encourage you to think about using that word as opposed to tribal, because um, one of the, the most used phrases and the common misconception is sovereignty. No, and, and let me back up, because that didn't come out right. Please familiarize yourself with the concept of sovereignty. Um, the Indian nations in this, in this country are sovereign nations, self-determined nations. And when um, news reporters keep referring to them as tribes or 
referring, uh, getting confused about taxes. I mean, we don't pay taxes because we are a sovereign nation. Um, there's a lot of confusion out there, and when you refer to us using words that are more appropriate for organizations, it, it continues this confusion that Americans have about who Native nations are. We're not just another minority. We have a political identity, a legal identity, that is different from other groups of color in this, in this community, so in this country. So um, in terms of language for us, um, tribal affiliation first, then ask the person you're interviewing what they prefer, how they prefer to be um, referred to in the aggregate. And if I could just follow up on that really quickly, um, people ask me, do you prefer Hispanic or Latino? And I say, I prefer Cuban American. Um, it, it extends, this, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's the idea that, yes, yeah, sometimes you have to use the catch all Hispanic or Latino if you're talking about the Hispanic vote or something like that. Um, but if you're talking to an individual, ask one more question and ask where their family's originally from or where they're originally from and I can tell you that they appreciate that so much better because yeah Cuban is very different from an Argentinian and from a Mexican from a Salvadoran so yeah I have nothing to add okay. <laughs> we have probably time for one more question so if I can uh, ask you to, to follow that thread a little bit further uh, what are some of the phrases um, around race and ethnicity that you wish people would just stop using? Red skin, squaw, um, uh, costume when describing a powwow outfit. Um, a costume is something you dress up in at Halloween to be something you're not. Traditional dress or regalia is what we put on to be you know, the most of who we are. So those, those three terms, I think. Illegals. Um, I'm, I'm thinking what to say because I'm still a presidential appointee, so I'm trying to figure out how to say this the correct way. Um, let loose. Yeah, okay, so stay up on all the cameras here, <laughs> my friend. Um, I, I think the, the N word is something that I think that we need to kind of wrap our heads around a little bit more. I guess we do have time for one more question then. There was a follow-up. Oh. So for oh. the N-word, when the N-word is used in the black culture, how can we, you know, use it? To, not use it, yeah. I don't think it should be used at all, but we know that it's used in music and everyday conversation. How do you get along, how do you get around that when writing about black people? This is a tough conversation. And Matt, Matt can have to laugh because Matt, did you write something one time that had the N-word in it one time? Did, yes. yes. And we, did we take it out? No, you just kept it in the poem. Okay. Yeah, so, so we've had this, uh, Matt writes for us sometimes, so we've had this conversation. Um, this is one of my personal biases. I agree with you. I don't think we should be using the word at all. I think we have to teach people historically what it means. Power to our people, we've taken a word and we've made it something more powerful for us. Um, but I think in our, in our perspective, it, what image are you trying to pr present to the main public, right? And I always speak, speak in life, as I speak life into things. So I, what do you want your children to think about when, you, when they read Mass 365? Yes, I want it to be provocative, but I also want to make sure that it's something that kids will understand, that they, read the, they see this word that they might not hear, they might hear that they understand, have a meaning behind it. At the same time, it goes to what I was saying to the gentleman before, you don't want to whitewash these things, but um, it really depends on the context of, of the word. I think we might have said the N-word. Did we say the N-word on yours? Did we look like N, asterisk? So that's what we did for that. And I'll just give you, we had a, a video in it where Paul Mooney was, uh, what was he saying then? He was, yeah, he was, yeah, and he was talking about the N-word and how people are using it, and that was in the link at first, and I freaked out, right? I mean, Paul Mooney is going, if you guys know Paul Mooney, he's a comedian, and he's a, a, a very provocative black comedian, he was just saying the N-word, the N-word, the N-word, and so I took that out and just left the N-word with that. So it's tough, it's a balance, but, it, but we, I left in there because it explained the context of what he was trying to say. And just really quickly, if I could, just, uh, just to elaborate on that, I think, I think the only time using kind of phrases like that, um, there's all sorts of phrases 
you know, there's the N-word, uh, if you're talking about uh, you know, illegals or wetbacks or whatever you want to call it. Um, I highly discourage anybody ever using any of that. But if a politician uses it, absolutely you should write about it, right? That's the only time, that's the only time I, can, I think that it should be quoted and written in full and not you know, asterisized, or is that a word? Um, but that's, I think, the only time that, that really we should be using that. That's a good point. We have one more question in the back. Oh, um, I love that phrase, First Nations, because it really is absolutely correct in, in its description. Unfortunately, whenever I hear First Nations, I immediately think of Canadian First Nations, um, Canadian people. And I think the Canadian Aboriginal people beat us to the punch and sort of co-opted that. But I, I see it being used more often in the lower 48, so maybe that will become more common, but that's my actual favorite phrase. Excellent. Any last minute thoughts? I, I would just like to make a plea to journalists out in the audience um, to add Native people to your list of contacts in uh, just te we're, we're teachers, we're doctors, we're professors, we're construction workers, um, and, and don't just come to interview us uh, at Thanksgiving time or on Columbus Day. And also, please, when you're covering environmental issues in Indian country, and this is becoming more and more common that these environmental issues come up, come up um, please look for other frames than just jobs. Um, these environmental issues are really viewed as survival issues in Indian country, and they can be framed as cultural issues, as historical issues, political issues. It's not just about jobs. And I'll, Oops, sorry. Now, I'll just kind of follow up with the same idea that don't feel that you only need to seek out a Hispanic voice when the state legislature is pursuing some sort of anti-immigrant legislation. Um, they're regular parts of their community. They go to school, they work, they do all that sort of thing. And I, I think it's too easy to only actively go out and find them um, when the issue of illegal immigration is coming up. And I, I would add, don't limit yourself to just calling it journalism. Journalism is so much more than that. Um, and I would really, if you're talking to kids of color, people of color, talk about how it can impact the community. Talk about how it can build a community. Talk about how it can in, in highlight issues that are going on in the community that other people are not doing. So don't just label it as journalism because it doesn't have the same impact if you talk to these kids about if they want to, these kids want to change the world. And this is a way that they can reach millions by just writing and interviewing people. So don't limit to just a journalism pitch. Tell them about the real impact they can have as, as journalists. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for your questions. They were excellent. And uh, we're going to take a quick break, right, Bob? Okay, let me take a <laughs> Be back here by 11.15. Oh, great, thank you.